a few weeks ago, after eating Chinese delivery, I opened my fortune cookie. It said, you will live a very long life. My gut reaction was, oh, shh. I was diagnosed with bipolar or manic depression 12 years ago. Without asking for my consent, my brain enters an, into unbearably long episodes of devastating lifelessness or weeks of extreme euphoria. Not only are the episodes unbearably long for me, but both extremes are confusing and scary for the people who love me and the people who work with me. I'm very aware that while it might be my diagnosis, the effects of the condition have an enormous impact on those around me. I'm not the only one who feels helpless. The simplest definition I can give for both extremes is that depression means I cannot start, and mania means I cannot stop. Most people live their lives somewhere in the middle, or what I refer to as the hyphen. And ultimately, the goal of anyone living with my condition is to exist somewhere in the middle, to live in the hyphen, the space between the two extremes. Who am I when I live in the hyphen? At my core, I'm a connector and a creative, and I have really big ideas. I have a great sense of humor. I love children and I love dogs. I'm a great writer and communicator. I'm a deep thinker. I love to make things with my hands. I am one of those teachers you want your children to have. And I'm obviously very humble too. <laughs> For close to three decades, I lived the majority of my life in the hyphen and not in the extremes. Who am I in depression? Do you remember those old fashioned jello molds where pieces of fruit cocktail grapes are trapped in the gelatin? When I'm depressed, my brain is literally stuck in gelatin. I cannot access any part of my creative mind. I cannot connect with people. I'm immobile, brain and body. I sleep and I watch hours and hours of TV. I'll go days shut in my house with my shutters drawn. And the only thing that gives me any pleasure is unhealthy food. I can go weeks without showering and days without brushing my teeth. I can go months without going to a grocery store. I understand wanting to die in a very profound way. Depression is humiliating, it's isolating, and it's lonely. About once or twice a year, I visit my manacle kingdom. Something will pop the grape out of the gelatin with so much force, it will bring me back to life again. It's like that brilliant Robin Williams movie, Awakening, when comatose people pop into life and everything is possible. Mania is an explosion of magical ideas and experiences coming so fast, they flow out of my brain like it's been trapped for months, because it has been trapped for months. I'm so stoked when it's coming. I'll go for three or four days without sleeping because I feel invincible and finally alive. I start doing art, I'll clean, I'll organize and create, I'll take walks, I'll write and record all my magic. On a, recent manic, on a recent manic trip, I realized that just because my brain is moving again doesn't mean that people understand what's coming out of it. In the hyphen world, I seem crazy. But in my world, it's anything but. It can be very scary and confusing for the people who care about me to see me in a manic episode. The most frustrating aspect of mania for me is knowing that it's gonna end and instinctively knowing that I have to be the one to stop it. The ratio of my depression to my mania is ridiculously unfair, probably 12 to one. For every 12 rounds of depression, I get one stunning round of mania. They have something in common though. Living in both extremes is lonely, humiliating, and exhausting. So why am I actually coming out to all of you? After all, sharing my private moments is humiliating. Not to mention how hard it was for me to find something to wear after seven years of takeout. <laughs> because it's real. You live with it, you might live with it just like me, or you have a son or a daughter, a brother or a sister, relative, employee or colleague who lives with it too. And they're living with it 
and so are you. And you know, and I know you feel helpless. While there is no magic pill to take it away, and I have tried most, there is something powerful you can do to help yourself and your loved ones. Identify your Sherpas. Sherpas are angels on earth that help us climb up from depression and down from mania. My Sherpas help me do life when I can't manage on my own. We need help with the basics of living, groceries, laundry, errands, mail. There's my Sherpa Cheryl. Cheryl's the type of person who loves walking into a mess and transforming it. She's usually the first person I'll text when I feel myself coming out of a depression. My house is a disaster, and I know she will walk in and help me put it back together without one morsel of judgment. As a way to maintain my house, I have three more little Sherpas, Patty, Esther, and Vivian. They come every Thursday. If my place looks like an adult lives there, it helps me keep more functional. Then there's my Sherpa, Sarah. She's a yoga therapist who comes to my house once a week. I'm uncomfortable exercising in front of people right now, so doing yoga and meditation in a private place is transformative. <laughs> Thanks. She will like that. Next, there's Katie. She's my hair Sherpa. Every two weeks, I go to Katie, and she washes my hair and blows it dry. This might sound like an extravagance, but it's one of the things that helps me feel put together. I also have plenty of Sherpas I don't pay for. I want to acknowledge my newest Sherpas, the TED Talk Sherpas. Daphna, Michael, and Christy. So when I applied to become a TEDx speaker, I was either in a hyphen or in a manic episode, <laughs> but I definitely wasn't in a depression. But when I found out that I was going to be a TEDx speaker, I was, and I've been in a depression the past couple months. I finally finished this a couple nights ago, and they gave me permission to bring it on stage. So thank you. Sometimes we need to make accommodations for people. It's really important. So some of my other Sherpas. My preschool work Sherpas. Holding a job is very complicated. I offer so much, but depending on my condition, I can't always show up. I've been let go from jobs because of manic depression, so I've learned to be upfront with employers and coworkers. I'm so grateful to be in a place that values my gifts enough to work through my absences. And it's filled with magical, magical children, the best medicine for me. My closest friends, sisters-in-law, siblings, aunts, and cousins are Sherpas too. They're the ones that keep me connected. They keep calling and texting, even if I don't answer. Their perseverance keeps me tethered. They don't make me wrong for not answering, and they embrace me when I'm ready to connect. I've had many psychiatrist Sherpas. <laughs> Many. And it's okay when they're not with you for the entire climb, because I know my psychiatrists are learning a lot more about the condition bipolar through me than through any book. And I'm currently in the market for a new psychiatrist, so. <laughs> and lastly are my parents. The Sherpas with the largest load. I don't think any parent wants to watch their grown child struggle as I have. My parents are everything to me. And they've been saddled with not only the financial implications of my diagnosis, but the emotional turmoil of, my de of watching me deteriorate. And I'm a Sherpa in my own way too. Because of my firsthand experience, I help others understand what the condition is. We have to be open about it. We must come out of our closets and be the force that pushes mental health over the tipping point. Thank you. Thank you. 
Sherpas don't give up. They don't judge. If you need a Sherpa, reach out and get one or two or five. Invest your resources in them. I received a powerful quote the other day from one of my Sherpas. I don't know who wrote it, but I need to share it as I close. When I is replaced by we, even illness becomes wellness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.